Modern technology companies have enabled misinformation to poison our information environment with little accountability to their users. They've allowed people who intentionally spread misinformation, what we call disinformation, to have extraordinary reach. They've designed product features, such as like buttons, that reward us for sharing emotionally charged content, not accurate content. And their algorithms tend to give us more of what we click on, pulling us deeper and deeper into a well of misinformation. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, a health policy reporter here at the Washington Post. And today we're joined by the nation's doctor. Uh, Dr. Vivek Morthy was confirmed earlier this year for a second tour of duty as Surgeon General. Dr. Morthy, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks so much, Paige. I'm looking forward to our conversation. We have so much to talk about today, um, but let's start off with this advisory that you issued yesterday around misinformation, calling it uh, around COVID-19, calling it an urgent threat, uh, one that continues to put lives at risk. What are some of the specific pieces of information that you consider to be the most threatening? Well, Paige, I'm deeply concerned about the consequences of health misinformation. It's why I issued this advisory. and, and just to set the table here, Surgeon General's advisories are not things that are issued every day. And these are products uh, that we produce uh, on rare occasion from the office when there is an urgent public health threat that we want to call the country to action around. And health misinformation fits that category. What we're seeing even with COVID-19 alone is that misinformation around vaccines uh, is impacting people's decisions about whether or not to get vaccinated. It's leading many people to forego the vaccine. And we know now, especially with the Delta variant, that the vast majority of people who are getting sick and more than 99.5% of the people who are dying from the virus are people who are unvaccinated. We've seen misinformation about masks lead people not to wear masks. We've even seen misinformation information about the virus lead people to not even think it's real. And so misinformation is really consequential. It is not new though, Paige. We have been struggling with health and misinformation for years and years and years for generations. But there's something different now. And what's different is the speed and scale at which it is spreading, uh, aided in large part by technology platforms and by, in many cases, are often inadvertent uh, you know, sharing of information uh, on these sites. So that is why I issued the advisory yesterday. And in it, we called the country to action around this, laying out a series of steps that individuals, healthcare professionals, educators, research professionals, technology companies and government could take to stem the tide of misinformation. But you mentioned that it's it's pretty uncommon to put out this kind of an advisory. Why right, Why now? For example, we've seen this misinformation for a really long time throughout the pan pandemic. Why perhaps didn't you put out the advisory sooner? What led to this moment? Well, we began de developing it uh, some time ago, actually shortly after I began my tenure as Surgeon General uh, at the end of March, uh, early April, uh, because we knew that misinformation was harming us. And we took a few weeks to put together the information so that we had clear uh, lanes for stakeholders like technology companies and educators and healthcare professionals to follow. Uh, we took some time to put together a research to bring together the best knowledge that we currently have in the United States and around the world around health information and we push this out. And the reason that we're, we're doing it now and not waiting further is, is that you know this is a threat in this moment. And, and we're, this is only gonna get worse unless we step up to do something about it. The thing is, Paige, it's COVID today, but it's gonna be other conditions tomorrow. If we want to think about pandemic preparedness for the future, we have to not only think about how we build up our manufacturing capacity for testing and supplies and how we resource our departments of public health, we've also got to think about information about how people get it, about how it's disseminated, and about how we ensure that people have access to accurate information so they have the freedom to make good decisions about their health. But I want to throw a question at you that I often hear of, of critics and particularly free speech advocates. And they say, you know, we talk about combating, combating misinformation, but it brings up concerns about censorship as well. And how far should the government or tech companies go in regulating this? For example, Facebook for a while was removing claims about the origin of the virus. Then they reversed course. Can you respond to those concerns um, to critics who say this can lead to the suppression of free speech? 
Well, it's an important question. And one of the things we raise in this advisory uh, is that this is a starting point, not an ending point for our work on misinformation. And not only are we laying out important actions that have to be taken, but we have also raised important questions that have to be considered. And look, free speech is one of the bedrock values uh, in our country. It's something that we've got to protect. But in my mind, that is not inconsistent um, with the idea that we can also prevent people from the harms of misinformation. Uh, you know, you, uh, you know, and on technology platforms in particular, um, where they have seen health misinformation cause harm, I believe that they have an obligation uh, to inform users about what is true and what is clearly false. I'll give you an example, Paige. When you think about the measles vaccine, we know that there have been myths that have been circulating for years uh, about the vaccine causing autism. This is based on a, a study that was done years ago that was later debunked. Uh, this has been disproven time and time again. But it is it, these rumors uh, about uh, the measles vaccine and autism spread like wildfire on social media, even though the scientists knew that this was inaccurate and, and said it time and time again. That stands as a clear example uh, where a platform having rules and, and constraints around sharing misinformation like that uh, seem perfectly appropriate. So I believe we can respect free speech uh, while also protecting people who are harmed uh, by health misinformation. And, and finally, just consider this. If you're a mom or dad out there, and like me, and you've got small kids at home, and if somebody, God forbid, gets sick, or if you see uh, the virus coming and you're thinking, how can I protect my children? It is your right to have accurate information that you can base your decisions on. And right now it is very hard for people to figure out what's true and what's not. Uh, and a lot of people will also share content they come across thinking they're helping others not realizing that content is false. So we have an obligation as a society to make it easier for people to understand what's based in science and what's not, because this amounts effectively to false claims uh, that articles and other posts are making uh, about COVID-19, about other health conditions that are misleading people and hurting them. We cannot tolerate that. Well, let's turn to the news out today. And we've uh, it's been announced that Pfizer has been given priority consideration for getting full approval of its vaccine. It says by January 2022. I know there are a lot of concerns mixed in here about, you know, trying to convince more people to get vaccinated and perhaps full approval could help. But can you talk a little bit about that time frame? Is that an appropriate time frame? And then do you think if we do see full approval, will that bring some more people on board with getting vaccinated? Mm. Well, it's a good question, Paige. You know, on the former, I'd say, you know, I'm going to defer to the FDA on the reasons for their decisions around the prioritization and the time schedule. But what I can say about uh, about the the vaccine, whether it's Pfizer's vaccine or Moderna's vaccine, uh, getting full approval is that there are some people for whom I think that would be helpful. We know from surveys that some people say, gosh, if there was, uh, you know, it, it, if it was actually it went through the approve, the regular approval process, you know, and, and was fully approved, that that might change their mind. Now, here's what I would say to that is that even though I, I think some people may be helped by that, uh, I think you can look at what's happened already with the vaccine, which is not only has it been studied in clinical trials, issued an authorization by the FDA, but it has now been essentially given to millions and millions of people in the United States and around the world. We have more experience with this vaccine than we do with many other uh, health products that, you know, at this stage of their development. And what that experience tells us is two things. One is that the vaccine remains remarkably effective uh, at reducing uh, infection rates in communities. The second thing is that it also has a very strong safety profile and that the rare risks uh, you know, of, of anything you may experience with the vaccine uh, are, are far outweighed, in fact, by the tremendous benefits that you receive by not having COVID, which we know itself uh, causes a variety of conditions, not just shortness of breath uh, and fatigue, but it affects the heart, it affects the kidneys, it affects the nervous system and the brain. This is not uh, a simple virus. This is a complicated virus with real consequences to our health. And so, I, again, I, I do think that uh, for some people, the uh, FDA approval uh, process may make a difference, uh, but I do think that we have a fair amount of experience right now, a tremendous amount of experience that tells us that, uh, again, the benefits of this vaccine far outweigh any risks. 
want to ask you about uh, a, a drug that for some reason has become sort of controversial um, in, in it's seen as a COVID-19 alternative therapy, potentially. It's ivermectin, which is an antiparasitic treatment. I know there's been more attention on this drug in recent days. How do you view that drug? Do you see it as potentially effective or are people overstating its potential? Well, look, I think it's always good to ask questions and to consider what additional therapies may be helpful when it comes to COVID-19. And what we've got to do, though, is subject uh, those ideas to rigorous study. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that there have been many ideas that have been put forward about existing drugs uh, that people think may be helpful. But in some cases, uh, when we've actually applied rigorous study uh, to those drugs, they haven't actually held up uh, as being useful. Uh, and you know, one clear example of that uh, you know, you know we, we've seen that, you know, sort of examples of that in the news. Uh, I would say hydroxy, you know, chloroquine being one of them. But uh, I do think that the scientific process has got to take precedent here. And I know that sometimes, you know, when you're in a situation, you're facing a virus that's that's scary, that's hurting a lot of people as COVID-19 has, that there can be a rush to try to anoint uh, a certain uh, drug or, or other therapeutic as uh, the cure, if you will. Um, but we've got to be cautious because we've learned from the past that uh, without having solid, reliable, reproducible data uh, that tells us that something is both safe and effective for treating COVID-19, uh, that we run the risk of doing more harm than good by promoting its use prematurely. Well, and it's been interesting to see how this drug has somehow gotten controversial. I'm not even quite sure how that's happened because it's it's a it's a drug. Um, but you know, there are people who just insist that this drug should be further studied. Do you think it's worth having CDC and FDA researchers test the drug to see if it's worth using or incorporating into treatment of COVID-19 patients? Well, listen, I'm certainly all for applying, uh, you know, science to testing theories, whether it's in medications. Uh, new medications or whether it's other approaches. Uh, but I, I think what this points to, uh, Paige, your point about there being a lot of controversy around this, I think also points to the fact that there are there's a lot of misinformation about medica this medication and others that tells people that they are scientifically proven uh, to work and to be highly effective against COVID when that the data isn't quite there. And this is another one of those uh, places where misinformation uh, can be very harmful. It can not only lead people sometimes to take medications that are unproven and to have uh, you know, unrealistic hopes for the effect that that medicine may have, but they can also generate controversy and disagreement and deepen divisions uh, between people uh, you know, when people aren't able to understand, again, what's true and what's not. So when it comes to science, I think what has been challenging Paige about misinformation during the time of COVID is that our understanding and our knowledge has been rapidly evolving. And sometimes that's not easily conveyed. Sometimes it's not effectively conveyed. And so, you know, if today, uh, you know, recommendations say one thing and more research develops and the recommendations change, people might think, hey, they said something yesterday and they said something new today. Uh, that sounds suspicious or something, uh, something seems wrong here. But the reality is that this is what happens in science is that things change based on data. But we've got to be clear with people uh, about what that data is. And when there isn't data, uh, when there isn't sufficient evidence to support a medication uh, or another approach, we've got to be clear about that too. That's a place where I think help, uh, you know, technology platforms can play uh, an important role in partnership with scientific authorities. Let's talk about masks for a minute. And I know that those of us who have been vaccinated have enjoyed not having to wear them during the, the summer heat. But yesterday, LA County announced it's reinstating indoor mask requirements regardless of one's vaccination status. Do you agree with that move? Well, I certainly think LA County and other counties have the right to make decisions uh, about how best to protect folks from COVID, and that includes around masks. Look, the CDC, when it issued its guidance uh, about almost two months ago now, uh, you know, about, around masks, what they were re what they were essentially basing their guidance on was science that was telling us that if you are fully vaccinated, that means two weeks after your last shot, then your chances of getting COVID or passing it on to somebody else, if you do get it, are actually quite low. And for that reason, they give people the flexibility to make a decision about whether they use masks or not if they were fully vaccinated. But two important things to say here. One is that the guidance for unvaccinated people is still the same, which is that you should be masking when you're in public places, especially gathered indoors, uh, if you are unvaccinated. You should still be washing your hands and, and keeping distance from others because your risk of transmission uh, is substantial. But localities and individuals can still make 
up their own minds about masks depending on their individual situation. So if you happen to be in an area where vaccination rates are low and the virus is spreading, more and more cases are developing, uh, or if you happen to live at home uh, with individuals who are unvaccinated, or if you yourself are immunocompromised and at risk, then you may choose to continue wear, to wear masks. And if you are a county like LA, and you're looking again at the numbers around you and seeing cases rise, you may choose again to put more measures in place to reduce the spread. That is perfectly fine. In this phase page of COVID-19, what we are seeing is a shift to a more and more local and regional strategies because we have very different vaccination rates in different parts of the country. Some places where we've got 80 plus percentage of adults vaccinated and others, other places where we have less than 30 uh, percent of people vaccinated. And that is gonna merit different strategies. Uh, but on that issue of so to reinstating the mask mandate, you know, as you mentioned, the CDC guidance stressed that if you are vaccinated, you have a really tiny chance of contracting the virus or spreading it to others. So I guess I'm wondering in L.A. or other places that are putting these in place, uh, is it really going to help slow the spread? In other words, is, is the point of these perhaps to just make sure that unvaccinated people are wearing their masks since it's hard to enforce something just on unvaccinated people. So then you sort of apply it to everybody. Is that sort of the merit in these things, considering what we've been told about vaccinating not vaccinated people not spreading the virus to others? That's the primary benefit, I believe, is to ensuring that people who are unvaccinated uh, are not spreading uh, the virus uh, unintentionally to, to others. Um, and look, you know, if you are, again, fully vaccinated, your risks of getting sick and transmitting the virus are low. But we know nothing is 100 percent, right? Like no vaccine is 100 percent effective. And that's why you see a small number uh, of breakthrough infections. Now, again, some people uh, may decide that you know, that risk is too much uh, for them and they may want to continue wearing masks. And especially uh, in an environment where you're not sure if folks are, are vaccinated or not, um, you know, some people may feel more comfortable with masks. So I think counties that see a lot of virus circulating that know they have a lot of people who are still unvaccinated, I think for them to take additional measures uh, to reduce the spread of the virus is perfectly reasonable. What is LA seeing in terms of numbers that's, uh, that's driving this concern that's causing them to reinstate the mask requirements? Well, you know, I won't speak for the county because, you know, I haven't been part of their internal decision making process, but I can say from the outside, if you look at, you know, L.A. County, you've seen uh, you do see cases going up, you know, which uh, folks see and unfortunately in many counties uh, now around the country, uh, you know, different counties may have different thresholds for when they decide uh, to pull the trigger, if you will, on additional uh, restrictions. And, you know, that depends on the people who are involved in driving decisions in the Department of Public Health. Uh, and, and that's why these decisions may vary from, from county to county. But I think what we're seeing, Paige, which is worrisome, is a growing number of counties which are moving into a high transmission category. Uh, and these are very often counties that have low vaccination rates. It's one of the reasons why uh, the administration has put together surge response teams uh, to bring additional testing, vaccination reinforcements, uh, to bring additional laboratory capacity, uh, as well as therapeutics like monoclonal antibodies and technical assistance to help communities in targeted ways. This is part of what I mentioned earlier, which is a shift that we see in, in the COVID uh, pandemic here in the United States from a broad national pandemic to a more regional local pandemic that takes uh, a more targeted approach. I know the other thing we're all paying attention to is the Delta variant. And um, although I'd love to not be having to pay attention to the Delta variant, but um, you know, I, I know that I often go to our tracker here at the Post, look at what's happening with cases, but also what's happening with hospitalizations and deaths. So we're obviously seeing cases go up largely because of this more transmissible variant. But do you expect to see hospitalizations and deaths increase as well? And I know that's something we may not know for a few weeks. Well, it's a good question, Paige, and because we are seeing uh, the cases primarily crop up in people who are unvaccinated, uh, I am worried about hospitalizations and deaths. Here's a good news, though. Uh, we have done a really good job as a country at getting the vast majority of seniors vaccinated, and we know that seniors are the ones who are high at risk of death uh, and hospitalization when it came to COVID-19. So I do think, unfortunately, we will see uh, an increase in hospitalizations and deaths. We've already started to see that actually in a number of counties that have been hard hit, uh, driven by the Delta variant over the last few weeks. Uh, but I don't think that it will be 
uh, nearly as bad in terms of hospitalizations and deaths as what we saw in January. Now, of course, it was a terrible situation in January. We had hundreds of thousands of new infections a day. We were losing thousands and thousands of Americans each day. It was terrible. Uh, I don't think it'll be that bad, but that shouldn't be our bar of what's acceptable. In this moment, every person who gets COVID-19, in particular, every death from COVID-19, is one that may have been preventable uh, because we have a vaccine, several vaccines now, three, that are highly effective, uh, particularly in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, so I do think that, unfortunately, we're going to see this get worse before it gets better. But this is a moment where we need to not only look to what the government is going to do, but we need to ask ourselves, what can each of us do to help vaccinate and protect our loved ones and our community? So asking your family and friends if they've been vaccinated, if they haven't been, asking them if you can do anything to support them in that process. If they need help making an appointment, they can go to vaccines.gov. It's so easy now uh, to get an appointment compared to uh, how it was before, and you can even walk into many places, get back vaccinated on your own schedule. But if they have questions about the vaccine, you can also find scientific evidence-based information at vaccines.gov. So however we do it, all of us have to step up and recognize that as individuals, as teachers, as employers, uh, as people who know have people in our lives who love and trust us, we can play an important role in helping people get vaccinated. Uh, President Biden has recently talked about in terms of doing vaccine outreach, actually going to door to door to reach people, visiting places of, of worship. Do you think this is the right approach? Will literally knocking on people's doors work, especially in these more Republican voter areas where people are more resistant to getting the vaccines? Well, Paige, I know there's been a lot of attention to this, but this actually comes down to a very simple idea, uh, which is this is about volunteers in communities, checking on their neighbors, checking on their family and friends. That's what this is about. And we've seen a number of volunteers in communities who are concerned about COVID spreading in their communities who want to help and they want to make sure people have the information that they need. So they're reaching out to their family and their friends. They're going into their neighborhoods, knocking on doors, offering people uh, information, offering to talk if they have questions. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that is uh, when we look out for each other uh, as a community, I think we do better. And if there's one thing we've learned from COVID-19 page, it's that we really do need each other. These pandemics are very hard to get through on our own. And especially when information is evolving and it's changing, it can be really, really confusing. Sometimes just having a conversation with somebody uh, about it can be incredibly helpful, uh, especially when they know that they're, you know that they're from your, your community, you know that they're there to help. Uh, and so that's really what uh, this effort is about. But it's one part of a larger strategy here, uh, which is uh, a strategy around helping support trusted messengers in communities so that they can reach out uh, to the folks that they know and love and make sure they're protected. It's a big part of what we've focused on uh, in the Biden administration. Again, this isn't about convincing people uh, to do something that they don't want to do. This is about making sure people have accurate information so they can make the right decisions for themselves and their families. So all you're saying sounds very optimistic, but of course the fact remains that there is a certain segment of Americans that are very, very resistant to getting the vaccine. And just going back to that door to door thing, I know since the president announced that some Republicans have criticized it saying it's potentially an invasion of privacy. Um, you know, how, what are some specific ways that you can reach out to that population if sort of even these tactics or, or, or approaches that you're trying to take are being criticized? Well, I don't think there's only there's a single strategy that's going to work uh, to, to vaccinate the rest of our country. I think we need to use many approaches and strategies, strategies that are respectful, uh, strategies that are uh, inclusive, strategies that uh, recognize uh, that this isn't going to be easy, but it's going to take all of us. And so as we think about the months ahead, in addition to uh, supporting uh, neighbors and community members who want to reach out uh, to their loved ones in their community, uh, we also want to work with schools and employers who are interested in supporting their students and employees uh, and their staff in getting vaccinated. Uh, we want to make sure that we are taking mobile units, mobile clinics that offer the vaccine uh, and getting them even more out into communities than we have to ensure that uh, it's easier for people to get vaccinated than it's ever been before. Uh, we'll keep doing all of those things. I think we will make progress. Uh, we are actually right now in the country where we have the highest levels of confidence in the COVID-19 vaccine than we've had since uh, December when the vaccine was first made available. That's good. It doesn't mean that we're done, though, because, as you said, 
uh, there's still a portion uh, you know, of our population that is in, in the wait and see category. Uh, they're not sure yet that they want to get vaccinated. And there's still others uh, who are disinclined to get vaccinated. So it will take time. But keep in mind this, that there is not a, a switch that we're looking to flip here in terms of hitting a magic number uh, in, in terms of how many people are vaccinated. What we've seen, in fact, is that the more people who get vaccinated, the fewer places this virus has to hide and the more lives we save. And so that is the goal, to just keep increasing vaccination numbers uh, by making it easier to get vaccinated, reminding people that it's still important because the Delta variant is spreading, uh, and to ensure that people have accurate information about the vaccine so they recognize this vaccine was developed uh, you know, with the, some of the best scientists in the world. It was tested rigorously, and it has been found to be extraordinarily effective uh, and very safe. What about vaccine requirements? As we approach the fall, we're seeing a number of colleges and universities mandate the vaccines. Should we see more of these mandates? And do you think this is anything that the that the state government should get involved in or even the federal government? Well, I do think, Paige, that we may see more institutions and communities such as hospitals uh, or other employers or universities uh, put requirements uh, around vaccination. And that is, would not be unusual in, in the sense that we know, for example, that um, a decision that's made on, in, on a local level uh, it has been around childhood vaccines. And we, in school districts all over this country, require kids to get vaccinated before they start school. We also know that many hospitals require the flu vaccine uh, for their employees and staff. And the reason they do that is they want to protect their patients. They don't want a doctor or a nurse or another staff member uh, to come in with the flu and then inadvertently give it to a patient who's already uh, ill with something else. Uh, and then ultimately we'll have a harder time. So I do think that you may seem, uh, see more requirements like that. Uh, and, I, and I do think also that if, um, you know, if depending on what happens with the FDA process, that uh, there may be more employers in schools that, uh, that feel comfortable, you know, moving forward with requirements if, uh, you know, in a scenario uh, where uh, full approval uh, was issued for the vaccine. Uh, but regardless, what I think you won't see is a requirement from the federal government uh, to, uh, to have people get vaccinated. This is a decision that historically uh, has not come from the federal government around vaccine mandates. Uh, it has come from private institutions uh, and from local government. I anticipate that will be the case this time around as well. Our time, our time is unfortunately drawing short, but I do want to return to a question about that misinformation advisory that you put out yesterday. Uh, you addressed, you talked sort of to social media companies and their, what you see as their responsibility in this. Have you heard anything from Facebook? Uh, have you set up a meeting with Mark Zuckerberg? What happens from here? Well, one thing I should tell you, Paige, is that we have been talking with and working with uh, many of these companies over the last many months. Uh, you know, this is my approach to this has always been that you know, if, if you have got an all of society challenge like this, you need an all of society response and you've got to work with everyone, uh, you know, to who can be part of the solution here. And so we want to continue working uh, with organizations, including technology companies. Um, but what we also want to do is to make sure that there's accountability here, that there's transparency in what people are doing, that we are not just taking measures that sound good, but ones that are actually having impact in uh, substantially reducing the challenge of misinformation. And that's why while we'll continue to dialogue with partners across the board, uh, we won't shy away uh, from being honest about whether we think sufficient progress is being made. Uh, and that's the case uh, you know, with the technology companies in particular. Um, Paige, one last thing I'll, I'll share just in general about COVID, uh, which I think doesn't get talked about very often, uh, is a hidden toll of this pandemic. And that's a toll on our mental health and well-being. I'm really worried about this, Paige, because when I think about the months ahead, I think about the fall as when kids will be back in school, when many employers are looking to bring uh, their staff back, uh, you know, in a fashion similar to how we were in 2019. Uh, I worry that we may try to snap back into 2019 without fully appreciating uh, the, the burden of this pandemic, without appreciating the stress and strain it's causing people's lives. There's a reason we're seeing anxiety and depression rates go up uh, during this pandemic. Uh, there's a reason uh, that clinicians are burning out at such high rates that public health workers and parents and caregivers are expressing high levels of depression and anxiety and PTSD and suicidal ideation. And so I think in this moment, uh, we have an opportunity to rethink our approach 
to mental health and well-being, certainly at a policy level to make mental health care more accessible, to invest more in prevention, certainly at an institutional level to make sure that schools and employers are doing what they can uh, to help support uh, students and, and, and employees uh, with their mental health, but especially at a personal level where we've had this stigma around mental health for a long time that's prevented people from admitting what they're struggling with. It's prevented them from coming forward and asking for help. But this pandemic, I think, has made many of us realize that we've all struggled in some way, shape or form during the last year and a half. And if we can be honest about that, if we can reach out to others with some kindness and compassion, recognizing that this has been a tough time for all of us, then I hope we will start down a path of creating a foundation in society for doing better to care for the mental health and well-being of all of our brothers and sisters. All important points. Uh, and certainly things to discuss at a later time. I just want to press you a little more, though, on the announcement you made yesterday. You have to know that the tech executives were watching that very closely and wondering, you know, what what that's what that means for them, what the government is going to be putting pressure on in terms of trying to crack down on some of this stuff. Has Facebook reached out to you since then? And do you expect to have any conversations with them anytime soon? Well, Paige, like I said, we've been in touch with many of the companies for months. I anticipate we'll continue uh, to, to be in touch and to, and to work with them to address the threat of misinformation. You know, as Surgeon General, you know, my job is to alert the country when there's a public health threat, to lay out pathways for action and to convene uh, the necessary players to take uh, action that will solve these challenges. Uh, what my job is not is to make legislation or regulation. That, that is something that will leave uh, certainly to Congress. Uh, but I anticipate we'll continue to work uh, with technology companies, with educators, with healthcare providers, and with others who have a role to address uh, the challenge of health misinformation. Well, unfortunately, our time is short. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that there's been a real personal toll of the pandemic on you and your family, having lost family members. So, um, you know, this is something I know that you feel very deeply and are concerned about. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. It was a great conversation, Dr. Morthy. Well, thanks so much, Paige. I so appreciate it. And, um, and thanks for the personal wishes as well. Well, I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. And to check out what interviews we have coming up, please, to, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and find more information about all of our upcoming programs. Thank you.